What style of investor are you? I'm a venture investor principally. I also angel invest. Uh, I don't day trade tokens. So I'm not a technical investor or a trader. So I want to make sure people understand that. I also want to say that uh, this is all given to you for educational purposes, and it does not constitute investment advice. Uh, so please consult with a professional investment advisor and do your own homework with respect to making any investment decisions. Why do traders need to understand blockchain fundamentals? Shouldn't technical analysis be enough? I wanted to say that uh, there are many different kinds of reasons why people are buying blockchain-based assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum and other significant uh, blockchain-based cryptographic assets. So in order to successfully invest uh, and trade, you really should be considering more than just technical analysis. So technical analysis really uh, governs the behavior of commodities and other forms of assets that generally have a fairly stable uh, you know, uh, base of value. So for example, if you look at something like currencies with uh, you know, foreign exchange, uh, you don't really see the foundations of this uh, shaking. Right. So, you know, to me, uh, when you see uh, blockchain based cryptographic assets, you're really looking at an asset class where there may be fundamental volatility. Right. So to me, I think traders need to understand blockchain fundamentals in order to make wise decisions. And I think that that's why they need to get some level of understanding over the fundamentals, more like an investor. So this is really uh, my mindset. So. Uh, you know, while there are technical analyses and there are people using technical analysis, some of the largest movements in the space <clears throat> have, have been around things like hard forks or, you know, things like hacking. So there's a variety of different, uh, you know, types of fundamental events that uh, transcend technical analysis, things like network updates. So, you know, I think these are all important factors. How should I reason about asset allocation and appropriate exposure? Do I need a thesis? What is an example of a thesis? You know, asset allocation is one of the most important things to understand, especially when you start to consider things like, you know, the Sharpe ratio. So, you know, when you think about a balanced portfolio, you really need to think about kind of what is a balanced, uh, you know, what does that look like? And I think you need to really be able to reason about risk. So the thing that I think is interesting about the cryptographic asset class is that it contains uh, a decorrelated quality with respect to other assets that may be common in a person's portfolio. So, you know, what's interesting about that is, is that modern portfolio management theory suggests that if you have the opportunity to invest part of your portfolio into a decorrelated asset class, then it is actually increases your risk to not expose yourself to the asset. But the, the question then becomes, you know, what is the uh, risk inherent to the asset? And then you have to kind of adjust accordingly your allocation. So I think the conventional wisdom is that a kind of a broad-based portfolio should contain somewhere in the maybe 2 to 5% exposure level to cryptographic assets. You know, for some people that may be very uh, overly bullish and that may be a, an extreme in exposure, but you know, for for others, they put much higher percentages of their portfolio into cryptographic assets, which you know I think everyone has to acknowledge is fairly risky. So I think you know thinking about asset allocation and appropriate exposure, it's important to try to understand, uh, you know, first of all, like how much, and I think also why. So I think that's when the thesis becomes important. So. Um, why are you allocating into this asset class? So, you know, I think that uh, folks that were allocating into this class, uh, you know, th that's where something like a thesis can come in handy, right? Now, I know that there's technical 
trading and day trading. And, you know, these are all kind of generally devoid of a concept of a thesis. But if you are uh, a little bit more like me, you may actually consider thesis investing, you know, which really may be uh, something, you know, let me give you an example of a thesis. So there's something that's observable in the sort of circulating market capitalization of coins. And, you know, when you see that, you may be able to infer, for example, one of the things I posit is that according to the power law distribution, you should expect the largest cryptographic asset, which is currently Bitcoin, to be approximately 50 to 51 percent of the total value of all cryptographic assets. So this is actually held to be true. And it is a factor that is observed by market watchers in the form of what's called Bitcoin dominance. So, you know, that's really, uh, you know, my own personal thesis. So I believe that, you know, you can create opportunities against that thesis. But, you know, you should do your own homework, right? That's, that's the way I look at Bitcoin dominance. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily look at this from the perspective of what's called the Bitcoin maximalist, because I don't. My, my thesis is not that Bitcoin will always maintain that dominance. It's rather that whatever cryptographic asset is most highly valued will retain about that much value in the market compared to the other assets. So that's my assumption based on the way that I reason about the value of these assets. How should I reason about risk and asset allocation? But, to me, you know, I think that I want to reiterate for you that, you know, if there is truly a decorrelated asset class, then you should expose yourself to that in order to reduce your risk, right? Because obviously, you know, you would be hedging against things like fiat currencies, you'd be hedging against things like stock market, you know, other economic forces. So I think that that's, that's an interesting and important mindset. You know, obviously reasoning about it from the perspective of fundamentals, you know, if you do see a pullback in the broad market, a decorrelated asset class may actually go up. Obviously, it depends on the scale, right? If the market goes down a lot, at the moment, my thesis would be that Bitcoin would also go down. And obviously, if the market went down to the point of like an extinction level event, you know, we would, people say things like you can't eat gold. So, you know, if, if you get down to the level where we're eating grass, then like, uh, you know, clearly all assets, you know, eventually will kind of find their way to zero. So, you know, to me, obviously, that's just the extreme case for risk and the mindset around asset allocation. And how can understanding blockchain help me with trading? So I do think that there's certain major events in the history of a blockchain, things like network updates, things like mainnet, uh, you know, things like uh, what's em emergingly called uh, initial exchange offering, uh, things like the difference between uh, user activated fork, uh, hard fork, soft fork, chain split. These are all distinctions that can help you understand the timing of you know, eventually, you know, so something that you could look at as a macroeconomic event, uh, you know, these are all, you know, factors that I think people should watch. And, and they're factors that, that actually involve quite a lot of understanding. So I think it may be, you know, it's a little bit too short of, a, of an interview to, to really go deep there. Um, but I will get into a few of the fundamentals. For example, I do want to define this term, which is what is a blockchain. So when we talk about blockchains, uh, I think what we really have to do is, first of all, define it narrowly. So when I say defining it narrowly, you can really look at it literally as a chain of blocks. So what is known to be a block? A block is essentially a convenience in uh, which was introduced by the Bitcoin uh, so-called blockchain, and essentially uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous founder of Bitcoin, never really used the term blockchain. So, you know, it's in a way, blockchain always has to stay kind of in quotes. But if you look at the use of what everyone calls a blockchain in Bitcoin, essentially a block is a collection of transactions, and it's a collection of transactions that gets written down into this 
record, a historical record called the blockchain. So the historical record is basically written down in blocks and each block represents a set of transactions. And the size of the block is really governed by uh, the developers of Bitcoin and the Bitcoin core. So um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what the appropriate size of blocks should be. Obviously, bigger blocks tend to uh, you know, increase the speed, but I think smaller blocks tend to increase the uh, reliability of, of the uh, record. Uh, so you know, and, and it really big blocks can create uh, pretty extreme problems as we're seeing currently in uh, the Bitcoin SV network. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of problems where you have contention about who's the longest uh, uh, chain. So th this, is, this is getting too far into the weeds. But what I did want to say is, um, what is the chain part of blockchain? I explained what a block is. The chain part is essentially that, you know, in computer science, there's a concept called a linked list. And a linked list is basically a set of uh, data constructs, each of which are connected by a link. So what connects the links of the blockchain are essentially cryptographic hashes. Now, cryptographic hash is basically a function that takes all the information that as an input and it outputs something that is essentially mathematically tied to the input. right? And so the thing that happens that's really interesting is, is that uh, the header of each block actually contains a cryptographic hash of uh, the previous block. So what that means is it means that it confers this property of uh, so-called cryptographic immutability. The word immutability is a very strong word. And it's actually more like uh, it's just very, very, very hard to change once it's written down. And uh, what happens is, is that you know, one way to visualize how hard it is is imagine a treasure chest with a chain that links it to another treasure chest. Uh, and what you're doing is you're lowering the treasure chests into a deep hole in the ground. Right, so if you if you imagine this as each treasure chest is a block and each chain is the blockchain, right? The question becomes how hard is it to uh, change the contents of the first block or a so-called genesis block, right? The hard, it's very very hard because it means that in order to change that block, you need to actually access every single preceding block, and you need to essentially manipulate every single block, you know, that came. Uh, you know, that came after. I, I'm calling it preceding because, you know, if you imagine yourself lowering this chain of blocks or chain of treasure chests, you know, the first one that you unearth will be, you know, the most recent one that you put into the ground, right? So, so I guess what I'm trying to express here is, uh, you know, what the blockchain does is it's essentially a recording device that confers cryptographic immutability. So it's hard, it's harder to change what's been written down. Uh, so the word blockchain is now increasingly used on a wide variety of things that may not produce chains of blocks, you know. And so if you look at all of the cryptographic asset tokens, you know, broadly speaking, those are all being called blockchain-based cryptographic assets. Uh, so I think the word is bandied about very loosely. Um, However, I think what's important to understand from the perspective of you know, the nature of these assets is essentially that uh, so-called blockchains consist of multiple layers. So you know, the blockchaining layer is really just the data storage layer, which essentially could be viewed as a database, uh, you know, as a database that has the properties of world readability, uh, pseudonymity typically. So you know you can everyone can read it, but nobody can say exactly who's uh, corresponds to which address. And then it has the property of so-called immutability, which is that it's you know very, very hard to slash borderline impossible to change the contents once written. So that's the blockchain layer. But there's another layer that often gets smashed into that layer called the consensus layer. And the consensus layer is actually the most important layer. And it's the layer that has the greatest amount of innovation in it based on what Satoshi wrote in the Bitcoin white paper, which is that the consensus layer is how do the network nodes agree that the contents of the blockchain, which are constantly being replicated, are true and represent an accurate depiction of history. 
So this is really the power inside of the Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin protocol created this thing called proof of work. Whenever you talk about blockchains, you're going to hear people talk about proof. And they're going to talk about proof of, they talk about proof of stake, distributed proof of stake, proof of work, proof of space time. Uh, there's a lot of different proofs. So the thing that's important to understand is the concept of on-chain proof and off-chain proof. So on-chain proof is really something where you're proving something that is basically continuously been under the consensus algorithm of that blockchain. So an on-chain proof tends to be a very strong proof. So for example, if you look at the trillions of dollars of transactions that have been processed on the Bitcoin blockchain, there are no uh, transactions that anyone can point to then say that is not an accurate record of what happened. So on-chain proofs tend to be strong proofs. There are a bunch of classes of proofs that are so-called off-chain proofs. And there are things, typically an off-chain proof is something that happened in the world. Uh, so for example, a lot of off-chain proofs are generally referred to as weak proofs because the question becomes, how do you know something happened? Because the value of a blockchain is correlated to the uh, veracity or truth of the contents of the information. So, you know, if you don't have a, a consensus proof that the contents of the blockchain are true, then you just have a database and a really slow database and one that may or may not consume a lot of electricity. So the point is, is that the proof is the most important thing in a blockchain, and that's generated by a consensus algorithm. And the consensus algorithm answers the question of how do you know that the other nodes in this uh, network are not lying? Because what can happen is, is that, you know, obviously you can attack a network by populating it with fake nodes. This is sometimes referred to as a 51% attack, although practical attacks in the world can be... Uh, potentially done with even smaller groups of nodes. So you can control a network and you can lie and you can double spend attack the network if you control enough nodes. So fairly detailed description of blockchain. What is a hard fork and what does it mean to traders? So you know, uh, what a fork is essentially, it's open source. So typically open source projects have the source code of the software. So a hard fork is basically this notion that you can take the software and you can just decide to do something different with it. So, you know, that's that happened in the history of Ethereum with the creation of Ethereum Classic. It happened in the history of Bitcoin with creation of things like Litecoin, uh, things like uh, Bitcoin Cash, the split between Bitcoin Cash, uh, ABC, versus uh, SV. So, you know, it, it, the forks happen again and again in the space. I think it means something very special to traders, which is that, you know, if it's a so-called chain split, it means that people who are holding the coin and who have custody over the cryptographic private key can actually get uh, coins on both sides of the fork. So, for example, if you were holding Bitcoin Cash before the split, you know, and you had custody over the key, then you would get both Bitcoin ABC, which ended up being called Bitcoin Cash, and you would get Bitcoin SV. So, you know, that's a really interesting event. Uh, you know, and, and th these forks are typically the result of, you know, network updates. Uh, so, you know, when the software gets updated. Um, How should I analyze a blockchain on the basis of fundamentals? So uh, that's really interesting, especially as you start to get into you know lower cap altcoins, which are much more speculative. You know, obviously, you know Bitcoin is the is probably the least speculative of a speculative asset class called cryptographic assets. But if you analyze a blockchain, the thing that you really need to kind of look at is you need to look at certain fundamentals like how robust is the developer community. You need to understand you know, how quickly the code is being updated. You need to understand things like uh, you know, what is the uh, algorithm that underlies the consensus of the blockchain. And you need to understand uh, you know, things like 
what is the uh, sort of technical foundation, which is often written in the form of something like a white paper. So, you know, I think that's a lot to understand, but, you know, honestly, I think if you are planning to make investments or trades in this space, I do think that it's important that you have at least a grasp of the fundamentals of this emerging asset class, because I think that the fundamentals are going to be the major drivers of the next kind of bull run, right, which is that I think that the first bull run, the major bull run that took you to $20,000 Bitcoin was driven uh, off of pure speculation. I think the next run should be driven off of much more fundamental basis, and it should be driven off of things like the creation of primary economic value to network participants. So, you know, I, I do think that in some ways that gets closer to something like a stock market where you're actually looking at you know, how the network produces value. And in the case of stocks, obviously, it's how does the company, you know, offer value to the market, to customers, and how does it capture that value in the form of revenue? So I think we'll have very similar ideas coming into the blockchain space, although I think the blockchain space has more to do with token value, capture of value of the network, and, you know, the inclusion of the value capture by the network participants. So I think it's a much more potentially inclusive model. And uh, I think as such, it's potentially quite a uh, nonlinear and a viral model. But, you know, I do think that we will see increasingly fundamentals driving the growth of these assets. And I think the fundamentals have to do with things like usage, usability, and uh, things like uh, transaction, daily transaction volume by users. Uh, so that's about all I have to say on the topic. Uh, if you want to follow me, my Twitter is Miko Java, J A V A. Uh, you can find me at Miko.com, M I K O.com. And uh, you can find my blog at blog.gumi cryptos.com. That's G U M I cryptos.com. And uh, you can follow me at those places. Thanks.